um, making decisions together. Um, so I have a little bit of information for you um, about endometriosis in general. Um, and if you guys have questions for me, feel free to ask at the end. Um, I'll read the questions aloud so everyone can see them, and I'll respond as best as possible. Um, so what is endometriosis? Um, so I have a surgical photo of what endometriosis looks like. You can kind of see little red um, dots, and it kind of looks bloody everywhere. Um, it's the leading cause of pelvic pain and infertility. Um, this is something a lot of um, places get wrong, that endometriosis is similar to, but it's not identical to endometrium. Um, endometriosis is histologically and pathologically different than endometrium, that tissue that lines the inside of the uterus. Um, it's very different, um, but it's very similar. Um, but it can only be definitively, definitively diagnosed through laparoscopic surgery. Um, and during surgery, they take a tissue sample and send it off to pathology. Um, the pathologist looks for the glands and stroma of endometriosis. Um, and I found this little slide um, over here of what endometriosis looks like under the microscope, and I totally thought it looked like a little T-Rex. <laughs> uh, I really love um, that it kind of looks like a little under monster because that's how it feels. I'm going to move on to the next slide. Um, this is what a normal uterus looks like. I don't know what a normal uterus feels like, but here's what it looks like. Um, this was something shared by Dr. David Redline. He labeled all the areas of the pelvis, which I found very helpful for reading reports to understand where things were. The most common place to find endometriosis is in that big cul-de-sac right above the rectum and below um, the cervix, so you can understand why endometriosis might cause a lot of <clears throat> pain during sex. Um, because it can be right around that area. Um, endometriosis can also be found on the uterus, the ovaries, the bowel, the bladder, um, the pelvic and abdominal walls, the uterine sacral lift ligament, um, and the fallopian tubes, and many other places as well. Um, over here, you'll see a picture from, that's actually from my surgery, um, and you can see how my uterus and my pelvic cavity do not look anything like the normal uterus. You can kind of see how everything is kind of stuck. Together. Um, I have a lot of um, pelvic and abdominal adhesions. And over on the right, you can see the tissue um, normally looks really pink and, and whitish and very happy. And on the right-hand side, you can see um, what tissue with endometriosis looks like. It's, it's very angry <laughs> and reddish. Um, endometriosis itself does not bleed, but it can cause the surrounding tissue around the lesions to bleed. So when you look at endometriosis, it can look a bit bloody. Um, I'm actually going to move on to the next slide. Um, so what causes endometriosis? I think that the mentors from Harry Potter are in my uterus wreaking havoc. So I set up a funny little photo for you guys that endometriosis is caused by dementors. Um, so let's go over some statistics and um, what they believe might cause endometriosis. Um, so one in 10 women have endometriosis, which is about 176 million women worldwide. Um, endometriosis is very common, even though there's not that much research about it because for many years, you know, women really weren't supposed to discuss um, issues with menstruation. We weren't supposed to discuss issues with sexual pain. Um, and until very recently, um, she was geared towards males. I, I mean, the gynecologists have taught in practice were mostly males. Um, so, you know, a lot of times when women came in with pain, a lot of us are told, like, that's normal. Period pain is normal. Um, it's not normal when it's endo pain. Um, so what are the theories behind what causes endometriosis? Um, for many years, it was thought to be Samson's theory, um, which is retrograde menstruation which means that blood from inside the uterus passes through the fallopian tubes into the pelvic cavity. Um, we know that this is not the cause of endometriosis um, because 80 to 90 percent of women experience retrograde menstruation, and not all of those women have endometriosis. So how can that be the cause if uh, pretty much everyone experiences this and not everybody experiences endometriosis? Um, Additionally, there's no line of implantation, and that was a big factor of them ruling Samson's theory out as being the only cause of endometriosis. So, for example, if I burned my shoulder um, and they did a skin graft, you would see a line where the skin graft implants um, itself with my skin cells. You would see kind of like a line of implantation 
And we don't see that with endometriosis. It's these cells are coming from elsewhere in the body and, like, attaching themselves on to, uh, like, other places in the pelvis. We would see evidence of that, and we don't see that with endometriosis. Um, additionally, there were two studies done, one here and one in Italy, um, where they did autopsies on fetuses um, who had passed and they found that about 10 to 11 percent of those fetuses had endometriosis, which is the same as the general population. Um, so that leads us to believe that endometriosis is laid down during fetal development. Um, Dr. David Redline talks frequently about, I'm pronouncing this correctly, Mullerian theory, um, where during fetal development, cells go to the wrong places. They're supposed to, like these endometrial cells are supposed to go to the uterus, to the uterine cavity, um, and instead they kind of just end up elsewhere in the pelvis, um, almost like tiny evil uterus is causing problems for us. Um, I decided to attach a link to his website, endopedia.info. His website is fantastic. It can be a little heavy on the medical jargon. There are a lot of surgical photos. If, if that's something you're not comfortable with, I wouldn't recommend going to his site. Um, but it's incredibly informative, so I really recommend checking out his website. Um, genetics also plays a pretty big factor. We don't know exactly how or what yet um, exactly, but we do know a few things. We do know that there are certain cytokines, um, which is cells that give other cells messages about where to go. Um, and that can really affect things, and it's obviously deeply rooted in our genes. You are five to seven times more likely to have endometriosis if you have a mother or a sister with endometriosis. Um, but if you're concerned if you have a daughter um, that she's going to have endometriosis, the instance not necessarily. Um, there just is a higher likelihood of your child having endometriosis if you have it yourself. Um, the environment, do pollution um, and chemicals play a role in mutating our DNA and our genetics in some way and causing us to have endometriosis. We just don't know the whole story yet. They're still doing research and we're still trying to find out. <laughs> if you'd like to be part of the research in discovering what causes endometriosis, Juneo Biosciences is conducting research currently on how genetics um, affect endometriosis. And you can sit in a tube and send it off to them and fill out a brief family history and you can help them figure out what is um, causing endometriosis based on your genetics. So symptoms. I love this picture of the angry uterus. I just Googled angry uterus, and it did not disappoint me because that's what I think is going on when I'm having my pain. Um, so a lot of common symptoms, painful periods, having cyclic pelvic pain, irregular or heavy bleeding. <laughs> But not all endometriosis patients experience pain only during their periods. Um, painful ovulation is another one, especially if you um, have cysts on your ovaries, such as endometriomas, you might experience pain during ovulation or if you have adhesions and your ovaries are trying to move and it might tug a little bit. There are lots of patients who also experience pain 24-7, um, also known as chronic pelvic pain. Um, I'm unfortunately one of those patients who experience pain all of the time and I'm constantly having to manage things. Um, painful urination can be another one. Um, sometimes this is caused by interstitial cystitis, which is very common in endometriosis patients. Um, and I'll kind of come back to explaining what, endo, um, what interstitial cystitis is. Um, also, sometimes there's endometriosis on the bladder or adhesions on the bladder, and that can cause painful urination as well. Um, additionally, painful bowel movements. Um, this can be caused by a myriad of things. Um, sometimes it is caused by adhesions or endometriosis actually on the bowel. Um, other times there's inflammatory chemicals that get released because of endometriosis, and this can irritate the, uh, the bowel, rather, and that can cause IBS-like symptoms. Um, and patients can then experience diarrhea, constipation, nausea, um, and as many of you know, distension or bloating, or as a lot of us like to call it, endobelly. Um, Dr. Andrew Cook discusses endobelly um, on his website, Vital Health. Um, so if you're dealing with very severe endobelly, I really recommend going to his website. He gives some really great suggestions, and especially with diet, it's really important. 
importance for dealing with um, any bowel symptoms you're having, which I'll come back to in a little while. Penis penetration or climax or following sex. Um, many patients experience pain with sex because of where their endometriosis might be. Um, and I'm actually one of the people that was experiencing pain um, following climax, and that was really aggravating because it was something I wasn't getting to enjoy anymore, um, and then climaxes weren't even satisfying at all. So um, we'll come back in a little bit as to how you can deal um, with pain if you're having pain um, from penetration or climax, and a lot of patients also have pain following sex. Back or leg pain is another one, um, particularly lower back pain. Um, sometimes it's just the uterus kind of pressing up on your lower back or depending where the endometriosis is, you might feel pain in your back um, or your legs. Um, also, endometriosis on the sciatic nerve can cause leg pain as well as endometriosis on the uterus sacral ligament. Fatigue is a big one. I don't know about you guys, but I'm exhausted all the time. No sleep is enough sleep. I literally had 12 hours of sleep the other day, and I could have gone back for another five. Um, a lot of patients deal with chronic fatigue. Um, sometimes the fatigue might be sick like and involved with your period, and sometimes it's always. Infertility is obviously a big one, and we'll discuss this a little further, why endometriosis causes infertility. Um, but that's also a really big one in the community. Endometriosis is the leading cause of infertility. Migraines as well, um, and migraines can be caused by an imbalance in hormones. So if you're suffering from severe migraines, I always suggest that patients go get a blood test with their um, GP. Just ask for hormone-free and total and make sure everything is level, especially because for me, I know um, if my estrogen levels get too low, I get, like, awful numbing um, migraines that are just really intense and I can't have any light or sound. And so I know a lot of patients are suffering from that as well. Getting proper care. This is a really big one. Um, the best surgical management is excision. Um, regular OBGYNs are not trained um, in excision surgery. They're not trained how to treat and remove endometriosis. So if you are being treated by a regular OBGYN, it's time to move on and find an endometriosis excision specialist. Um, regular OBGYNs are only trained to burn endometriosis, otherwise known as fulgration or cauterization, or they just shave off the surface of the endometriosis um, using a laser, which is called ablation. Ablation has high recurrence rates, about 60 to 80 percent. Um, if you think of endometriosis like an iceberg, this would just be shaving off the top of the iceberg, but there's still iceberg underneath the water. So this technique leaves disease tissue behind. Um, an excision, excision specialist um, is not an OBGYN. They're not delivering babies till four in the morning and then going to do endosurgery to support their practice. There's no deliveries involved when you're an endometriosis excision specialist. Um, they eat, sleep, and breathe endometriosis surgery day in and day out. That's what they do in their fellowships, and that's what they study. They study endometriosis. Um, excision is very different from um, fulgration or ablation as it cuts out all of the endometriosis lesion, the entire iceberg. Um, and this surgery... Um, has low recurrence rates, about 5 to 10 percent or lower, depending on the skill of the surgeon. Um, and you really need to take that into account when you're looking for a surgeon, um, their skill level, and um, what areas they're able to operate on. Um, if you have bowel endometriosis, you need to make sure that you find a surgeon that can operate on the bowel. Um, and I, I typically tell patients to look for a surgeon that is comfortable operating anywhere in the pelvis and abdomen because Sometimes they open you up and they find endometriosis in places they didn't expect to. Um, and if you can see below, um, I put some um, diagrams from Dr. Andrew Cook's book, Stop Endometriosis and Pelvic Pain. Fantastic read and very comprehensive for patients. I highly recommend um, reading his book. On the left-hand side, you'll see um, an endometriosis lesion and how it sits in the tissue. Um, and that ablation is, is pretty much just cutting off the top. And on the right-hand side, you'll see what excision is and how it removes the entire lesion. Um, if you're interested in finding an excision specialist, there are some ways to do that. Um, there's a Facebook group called Endometropolis, which is really fantastic. It's run by um, Libby Hopton, who does medical research, um, and she's an endocrine for herself. She works for Dr. Andrew Cook, and Dr. Redwine is in that group as well as uh, Dr. Zalemba. Um, they have a map of specialists, and they're actually in the process of updating it, um, I think, the next month or so. 
um, so you can look on the specialist map. Um, just remember that all specialists are not created equal. You really have to do your research when you look for specialists that some are better than others. There's also a list in the Facebook group, Nancy's Nook. If you go into their file section, you can find their specialist there. So now we'll discuss infertility a little bit. Um, I'm just going to kind of brush the surface of infertility because it's not my area of expertise because I have not yet tried to become pregnant and I have no plans to in the future. Um, but I do know a lot of wonderful specialists to refer, refer people to if this is an issue that you're struggling with and I can give you some information on this. Um, about 30 to 40 percent of endometriosis patients um, struggle with infertility. But just because you have endometriosis does not mean that you will struggle with infertility. Um, endo affects egg quality, um, can affect late pregnancy complications such as miscarriage, um, and causes low AMH. Um, if you are experiencing infertility and you'd like some more information and some help on this, you can visit Dr. Jeffrey Braverman. He is one of the best endo and infertility specialists um, in the country, um, and he has a group of researchers and immunologists that work with him as well. His website is preventingmiscarriage.com, and on his website, there's a video on endo and recurrent pregnancy loss. Um, I put a little bitly link there for everybody who would like to write it down and, and take a look. It's really informative, um, and excision can improve your chance of pregnancy, um, and he gave me a little statistic. It can improve things like 80% in women under 35 who have low AMH, so excision is really essential. Um, if you're trying to get pregnant and you haven't been able to yet, um, endometriosis can really be getting in the way um, of you producing a child because of the eggs or because um, a fallopian tube might be closed because of endometriosis. There are just lots of factors there. A fantastic organization is, is Resolve. They're the National Infertility Organization, and their website is resolve.org. Um, and also, and then Endo Warriors works with um, Casey Gurna. She used to live in New York and run our Westchester group, and recently she moved to North Carolina, and she's our satellite head in North Carolina. She's an endo sister and an infertility counselor, and she's offered to give anyone here tonight who's seeking support with infertility to contact her personally. Her email is caseyburna at gmail.com. Endo Miss. This is a big one for me because they are stressed all over the internet and media and drives me crazy um, seeing a lot of these myths spread around. Um, even on pages such as uh, Mayo Clinic has a lot of misinformation, so you have to be really careful where you get your information about endometriosis. So let's talk a little bit about stages. Um, stages are a little wonky, and a lot of the top specialists are trying to get everyone else to kind of agree on the new staging system. Um, staging is a little tricky because it doesn't necessarily show um, how deeply infiltrating endometriosis can be in endometriosis outside the pelvic area, such as in the abdomen or on the bowel. Um, so stages are a little tricky, too, because they don't correlate with the amount of pain or symptoms that patient might be experiencing. For example, patients with Stage 1 disease might be in a lot more pain than another patient who has stage 4. I've heard of stage 4 patients who didn't even know they had endometriosis until they had difficulty getting pregnant. Um, and this kind of causes a lot of issues because it can cause patients with stage 1 disease to be dismissed by their doctors. They'll be like, oh, you don't have that much endo. You should be in so much pain. Um, and that's just not the case at all. Pregnancy. Pregnancy does not cure endometriosis. <laughs> we hear this a lot. Um, and as you can see, I posted um, an awareness photo that we use during um, endometriosis awareness month on the bottom. It says not a cure when someone was pregnant. Was pregnant. Um, pregnancy can increase progesterone um, during pregnancy, and it can kind of reduce your symptoms a little bit. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of times after women give birth, their endometriosis pain can return. Um, hysterectomy and menopause also do not cure endometriosis. Um, endometriosis might um, require hysterectomy if the patient has extremely heavy bleeding um, or adenomyosis. We'll get back to that in a little while. Um, but endometriosis can produce its own estrogen because endometriosis produces um, aromatase enzyme. Um, so endometriosis can be present with or without the uterus, and that's also with taking the ovaries and leaving them. Um, Dr. Andrew Cook made a statement on Facebook that I like to share recently. 
And I posted that at the bottom for anyone who needs to share that with somebody who keeps telling them to just get a hysterectomy because that will most likely not be your answer. Um, it is for some patients. Some patients do feel relief after hysterectomy, but there are so many patients that come to us on a daily basis saying that they had a hysterectomy and they're still in agony, and that's because the endometriosis was not properly excised um, during the hysterectomy. GnRH, also known as Lupron, Lupron does not eradicate disease, and a lot of doctors use Lupron to treat disease instead of um, a proper excision, which isn't good for patients. Um, Lupron is only used to treat uterine pain, um, but it only works for about 5% of patients at managing some pain. Unfortunately, it has horrible long-lasting side effects, and I know this from personal experience. Um, unfortunately, a lot of patients who use Lupron have decreased ovarian function. I think some studies showed that it was about 60% um, of women didn't return to baseline ovarian function after one year of stopping the medication. Um, it can also cause bone density loss. So top specialists really don't use Lupron anymore unless it's highly necessary. Um, sometimes they'll use it because it can shrink lesions, um, but it doesn't do anything to the actual disease itself. It can kind of just make the lesions shrink a little bit, and sometimes specialists might recommend you doing a little bit of Lupron before surgery to make um, the operation a little easier on them. Um, but Lupron should not be used to eradicate disease. Comorbidities, um, it's another way of saying lots of other problems and no patients seem to have. <laughs> I put a little clip of a post that I sent on Facebook after a very um, disconcerting doctor's appointment, and it says, when your diseases have diseases, and because you've had certain diseases for so long, you now have other diseases. Um, I hear patients every day saying that they have tons of things on top of endometriosis. Um, a big one is adhesions. Endometriosis causes adhesions. I put up a picture from my surgery where you can see that um, a part of my bowel, the omentum, um, was being pulled upwards towards the abdominal wall, and it was just really painful. I was having um, a really hard time functioning at all um, before that surgery where adhesions were kind of just tearing apart my bowel. Um, so that's a big one with endometriosis patients. Interstitial cystitis is a big one. About 80 to 85 percent of women with endometriosis um, have interstitial cystitis. It's a thinning of the lining of the bladder, and it can cause um, acid and potassium to leak out of the bladder into the pelvic cavity. I unfortunately suffer from IC as well. Um, it can cause pelvic pain, painful urination, urgency, frequency, and bladder spasms. I luckily found this fantastic website on the IC network, and their website is www.ic-network.com. And on their website, they have a diet that is specifically geared towards interstitial cystitis. And if you are suffering from IC or you have any issues with your bladder, I highly recommend trying that diet because that will seriously reduce your symptoms. Um, IBS and other bowel issues, um, as I discussed before, you know, it, IBS and endo is super tricky because we don't know, um, is endo causing the IBS? Do you have endo and IBS? Um, it, it's really hard to tell, and in certain patients, it's almost impossible to tell because they're suffering from both at the same time, and it's hard to tell if, you know, one's causing the other or if there's two, um, there's two diseases at play, just hating each other. Um, Oftentimes, we'll see autoimmune and inflammatory issues like fibromyalgia in patients who have endometriosis. Um, adenomyosis, which is um, endometriosis in the uterine wall. A lot of times with adenomyosis, we'll treat that with hysterectomy. But there is another procedure for those of you that are interested in keeping your uteruses if, um, or uteri. Um, if you have adenomyosis, there's something called the Osada procedure, which very few surgeons do, um, where they cut open the uterus, take out the endometriosis in the walls, and then sew the uterus back up. Um, it's a pretty amazing procedure, but I've, you know, I've seen some of them done by Dr. Andre Ovidali, um in New York. Chronic fatigue is an awful one. As I said before, I suffer from horrible fatigue, and I put a little infographic on the side about the pain fatigue cycle and pain. And fatigue can really increase, especially if you're not taking care of yourself well, if you're overworking yourself, if you don't sleep all through the night, if you're under a lot of stress and anxiety, you're having depression. Um, and sometimes medication can um, increase fatigue as well. Pelvic floor dysfunction is a really big one. 
Um, I recommend that, that everyone go get some pelvic floor physical therapy if you're in pain. Um, pelvic floor dysfunction is a tightening of the muscles in the pelvic floor. When you're in pain, the body's natural defense is kind of like tense up and, and you curl up in a ball like we all do with our feeding pad. Um, and then even after the endometriosis is removed, um, those muscles might still stay very tight in the pelvic floor. Your pelvic floor is kind of like this cradle underneath you, and it goes from the pelvis to even behind you in the buttocks. Um, and if you're not working on those muscles and relaxing those muscles, you're going to continue to have a lot of pain. Brain fog is a huge one. I'm sure you've seen that I've been stumbling all night because my brain fog today is out of control. Um, brain fog can be caused by pain, by fatigue, by hormones, medication. Um, I'm sure there's a myriad of things that cause my brain fog um, in a day. But um, it can be really tricky because people just think you're not paying attention or that you're just too tired. And a lot of the times it's just it's foggy in your brain. You lose your memory to things. Pelvic pain, something a lot of us suffer from. Pelvic floor physical therapy, as I was saying, um, they do myofascial release to help um, with different symptoms of endometriosis. A major one is painful sex. I would not be able to be sexually active at all um, with a partner or alone if I was not attending pelvic floor physical therapy. So if you're going to seek out a pelvic floor physical therapist, find somebody who does internal work. Um, the International Pelvic Pain Society uh, has a great website, pelvicpain.org, and there you can click on patients and find a provider to see if there's somebody in your area who can treat you. They can also help you with some bladder issues, bowel issues, um, colonic massages are fantastic. Um, and they can really um, work on scar tissue. I have them um, work on my incisions and the scar tissue around my incisions pretty frequently. Um, and they can kind of stretch the adhesions that I have in my gall, and, and that actually helps free things up a bit in my gall. My stomach will start to move rather than feeling so stuck. Um, Amy Stein, who is a pelvic floor physical therapist here in Manhattan, um, wrote a fantastic book called Heal Pelvic Pain. And there's a DVD that comes along with her book called um, Healing Pelvic and Abdominal Pain, and you can buy that on Amazon. And it's great for um, just doing half of exercises. Excuse me, that's my medication alarm. <laughs> um, pelvic pain management specialist. Um, you can see a pelvic pain specialist um, for various medications to help with your pain. Um, you can also try trigger point injections for certain types of pain as well. And I really highly recommend finding a pelvic pain management specialist if you're really suffering. Sometimes they think they have um, answers that other doctors just might not even know about and can give you a myriad of options to try. A diet is super essential when it comes to dealing with endometriosis and inflammation and, as I said, interstitial cystitis. Um, we made this great infographic, and I think we, I mean, Jordan Davidson because she has the graphic skills that I do not. <laughs> she made this for us. Um, it's a quick guide to the end of diet. I really recommend keeping a pain slash food journal. And what that means is on each page, you write your pain levels throughout the day and what you were eating um, throughout the day. And then you can kind of look at your journal and say, okay, well, I ate this on this day, and the following day I had a lot of pain, and you can find triggers, especially because everybody is different. There is no one endo diet for everybody. A lot of patients do find relief with a gluten-free diet, but that doesn't mean that you will. Like, I don't find any relief with a gluten-free diet, so um, I have to do other things. If I have dairy, they have to be organic. Um, if you're going to eat make sure that it's hormone-free, um, organic, grass-fed, whatever. You know, make sure you're getting the best possible products that you can. Um, alcohol and caffeine, you got to cut out. It's, it's pretty much just a really bad irritant. And red meat has a lot of estrogen as the soy, um, as I'm sure many of you know, so that was a big thing for me to cut out as well. And it's really hard because sometimes you just want to treat yourself. And if you're going on a big diet like this and you have a night where you know you're not doing anything the next day and you want to go have some chocolate and you want to have a steak, how about it? I mean, you're only human. But, um, you know, really watch your diet because it can really help reduce your symptoms. So alternative therapies, I'll talk a little bit about those because sometimes I find that alternative therapies, um, once a patient has gone through excision, can really help. As we discussed, pelvic floor physical therapy is a big one, but I'm going to touch on some of the others. 
um, relaxation and trying to relax their muscles in your skin is really helpful. If you go onto YouTube and you search Endo Yoga, there's a great page on there of different yoga poses for endometriosis, which um, unfortunately I recently injured my hips, so I'm not allowed to do any yoga, but before that, um, I was doing yoga at least four times a week, and I did them at school with my students. Um, so if you have kids at home, get them to join you and do yoga as often as you can. Um, meditation, there are some great apps um, for your iPhone and iPad um, that you can use to help you meditate for a few minutes a day and just try to relax because having a chronic illness and trying to keep up with people who are healthy um, is really hard, and you just need to give yourself a break sometimes. Um, deep breathing, you know, it sounds really silly, and the first time I heard it, I was like, yeah, okay, because deep breathing is going to help my pain, and you have no idea what I'm dealing with, but it's true. And you're in a lot of pain, and you just, it just kind of relaxes the muscles from tensing up a bit, and it really helps things. Um, mindfulness meditation is a really great thing I found for managing um, my pain and my anxiety. I hate getting MRIs, and I need to do them pretty frequently. And I'm claustrophobic, so um, it's really awful. And luckily, mindfulness meditation helped me um, fall asleep during the rest of when I got really relaxed. Um, Alexandra Milfa is a fantastic therapist, um, if anybody needs a counselor. And she also has some um, mindfulness meditation um, CDs and clips and things like that um, on her website, and I found some very helpful. Acupuncture can be really fantastic for chronic pain and um, especially for nausea. I found that that was um, a really wonderful factor in treating my nausea. Um, and my acupuncturist gave me some herbs. Um, I unfortunately couldn't um, digest them, so she gave me herbs that I could kind of um, light and stick on my body to penetrate my skin and, and help my nausea and my pain. Um, a TENS unit is a little machine, and it has little pads with electrodes on it, and you stick them in various areas. Um, I wouldn't recommend putting them directly on your abdomen or pelvis. Um, just because of intensity, I would speak to a pelvic floor physical therapist about where um, you specifically should put your pads, because for each patient, it's going to be different depending on um, where you might be sensitive. And it sends um, electric um, pulses to the nerves, and basically the science behind it is that it distracts um, the nerves from pain um, because the brain can only process um, so many sensations at one time, so it kind of distracts you for a few minutes. Massage is a really great one to work out any muscles, um, and it's also just relaxing, and sometimes you just got to treat yourself to massage and, and take a new day. <laughs> Medical marijuana is a really great one for those that live in a state where it's legal. Um, cannabis um, THC can really help with nausea. Um, and I'd like to talk a little bit about CBD because CBD has been um, a really wonderful tool for me with my pain. Um, CBD, otherwise known as cannabidiol, is a compound of marijuana. Marijuana has a couple compounds in it um, and the hemp plant in general. And certain compounds can be extracted to use for different things. Uh, you know, hemp fibers can be used to, you know, make clothing and houses and things like that. They do amazing things with hemp. And CBD, when it's extracted, is the, <laughs> excuse me, the compound that helps with pain. And it can um, reduce um, inflammation and lower anxiety and help with sleep and muscle soreness and things like that. Um, CBD, if it has THC in it, a certain amount is legal. Only in states with medical marijuana is legal. But if CBD oil is um, produced in a certain way, they extract the CBD oil in a certain manner, and it has less than 1% THC, that is legal in all 50 states. Um, and there are only a couple places where you can get those products that are legal in all states. Um, I like to get my products from a place called AOM Mother Nature. They have a CBD cell that I love that um, has comfrey and castor oil um, and arnica and peppermint and wintergreen and lavender. Um, it smells fantastic, and I rub it on my belly every night, and it just really is it's soothing, and it also kind of forces me to give myself a little THC with a belly rub. So um, they also have some vape oils and things like that, um, and if you're looking to experiment um, and see if CBD is right for you, um, they have a Facebook group called CBD May Help, um, and they're really knowledgeable there, and I recommend speaking with um, the admin there to see um, what products you might want to try. 
also um, relationships. Very tricky with enemy with this. I'm still trying to figure that out myself. Um, uh, endometriosis can be really isolating. I feel like I live within the four walls of the apartment um, more than anything else. I'm, I'm in bed so much. Um, and that's kind of why I decided to start Endo Warriors. I was so isolated. I was in a lot of pain. I felt like a lot of my friendships had gone by the wayside, and I felt really alone. And I didn't want other Endo sisters to feel the same way that I did. Um, so I decided to create Endo Warriors that way they could meet other women Endo in person and online. Um, I really recommend reaching out to your friends if you're struggling with feeling isolated from endometriosis. Um, face time with your friends and family more when you're in bed and even if you look kind of crappy, you just like say hi for five minutes if you're able to, you know, to do that. I really recommend just trying to keep in touch as best you can. Um, your social life can kind of really take um, a hammering when it comes to endometriosis because you have to spend so much time um, recovering from life in bed. Um, and I think that, you know, I really struggled with my friends and family understanding what I was going through. They just didn't understand why after I had surgery, why I was still struggling so much um, and why every aspect of my life was affected by this disease from what I eat to the clothes I wear to my bowel movements. Um, how often I'm able to get out of bed. And, you know, there was just nothing to explain to them what I was going through. And I didn't have the words. I was just feeling frustrated and alone. Um, so I went to the spoon theory. If you don't know what the spoon theory is, immediately go to Google and look up the spoon theory. Um, this amazing woman, Christina DeDiriano, um, talked about her lupus and how it affects her life and how – um, she has to strategize her day right, because of her disease. Um, find a really good friend or family member who supports you because not everybody is going to be supportive. Um, I got really lucky that my best friend, you know, took the initiative to understand what I was going through, started reading articles, read the spoon theory, and she'll call me and ask me, like, what are your levels like today? I <laughs> love her. She's usually the best. And, um, it's great to have somebody who will come to appointments with you and who just brings you joy. Um, sex is really painful for a lot of patients. Um, I really struggled with this, especially in my last relationship. Um, we started dating right after I had surgery, um, and we wanted so much to be intimate and to be physical with each other, and I just wasn't capable of penetration. Um, so we had to look to um, other means of intimacy, so, you know, try to remember that um, if you're in a relationship with a man, that, that um, you know, penetration isn't the only means of physical intimacy. There's manual stimulation, there's oral stimulation, and frottage, which is one of my favorites. I'm really grateful to Dan Savage for putting a name to something that I like to do with my ex-boyfriend. Um, frottage is, you know, for lack of a better explanation, general rubbing. Um, so you can use lubrication and, you know, wrap up against your partner. Um, and it's the closest thing to penetration that we could manage. And it was fantastic because at that point we were so sick of manual and oral stimulation. Um, and we wanted to find another way to be intimate with each other without penetration and, and hurting me. Um, and that was it. And it was fantastic. Um, you can also introduce toys into the bedroom if you're too embarrassed to go to the toy store. Um, there are a lot of great websites, like twotimid.com. Um, you know, there's lots of great sex toy websites. Mitten Kitten is another one. But, you know, it's mentioned. Um, and Deb Cody and Nancy Fish wrote a fantastic book called Healing Painful Sex. If you're dealing with painful sex, I highly recommend reading that book. Um, I also really like to make a distinction between my clinical vagina and my sexual one. You can even use another word. I personally like the word pussy. Um, some people feel like that's a little dirty, and I really felt that way for a long time, um, that that word was a little too dirty for me, but eventually I kind of had to get over it. I I felt like my vagina was being um, examined so often by doctors and by my physical therapist, and I just felt like a patient all the time, and it became um, it became way too hard to feel sexy and to want to be intimate. Um, and one day my therapist said, name your vagina something else. Like, don't call it your vagina anymore. Like, make a distinction between the vagina that gets seen by the doctor and the vagina that gets to have sex with your partner. 
and I thought that that was a really brilliant kind of form of advice because it gave me a new sense of identity. It gave me a new sense of my sexuality um, and helped me express myself more in the bedroom. And I didn't feel like a patient anymore once, you know, the clothes came off. So I really recommend thinking about um, coming up with a word that you feel comfortable with um, other than vagina so that you're not feeling like a patient all the time and that you can feel sexy. Yeah. I also posted this little um, infographic. I wish I could credit whoever wrote this, but I do not know where I found it. There was, um, it was just a meme online from one of the chronic um, pain pages that I follow. And it's just um, suggestions for those um, to give other people to help you um, when you're dealing with pain. So support. Support is so, so important because this disease is incredibly painful. Um, it's trying, it's isolating, and I think that everybody needs support. No matter where you get it from, find someone to listen to you. Um, you can talk to a therapist um, or a chronic pain counselor. You should really join some endo groups online. There are some really great ones. If you go onto Facebook and write endometriosis support or endo support, a ton of pages come up, and you can join a lot of different groups. Some might be right for you and some might not. Um, there are some groups that um, allow venting and there are some groups that are more about education and discussion about endometriosis. So go to those groups and look at their rules and their guidelines and see which ones might be right for you. Um, End of Sister Love is so unique and fulfilling and I honestly don't know if I'd be sitting here today without the love and support of my end of sisters. I mean, I felt really alone and really useless for a really long time time until I started Endo Warriors, and I had women with this disease saying, me too. Um, I think that's just completely and utterly invaluable, and I think it's really important for Endo Sisters to have that as well. I think it's, you all deserve to have support from somebody who knows exactly what you're going through. Um, share info about Endo and chronic pain on social media. I know not everybody is comfortable with that, especially if people from work might follow you. You don't want people to know that you suffer from this illness. Um, you might want to make a Twitter or Facebook account um, that's separate so that you can um, be active on social media with endometriosis and your chronic pain. Um, and I think spreading awareness um, is really important for understanding um, not just for you but for people in your life. Um, my life really changed when I came out of the endo closet. Um, you know, I, I had a hard time telling my friends what was really going on and why I was suffering so much. But once I did, I saw the support kind of flood in and saw my friends take an interest in um, what I was struggling with. Um, so I put a little meme up there for everyone that's following us tonight. This is when you're feeling like you're at your weakest is actually when you're the most strong. Keep finding fight hope again and don't forget how brave you really are. Um, I also want to bring up suicide. It's been... Um, a really hard year in the endo community. We've lost some endo sisters to suicide. Um, if anyone is ever feeling overwhelmed, depressed, like they need someone to talk to, please feel free, A, to reach out to me if you need a friend who's an endo sister. You can PM me on Facebook anytime, day or night. I will respond to you as soon as I can if I'm not asleep or at work. <laughs> um, and these crisis lines are um, the suicide hotline, and they have people on, by, on standby 24 hours, seven days a week, including holidays. If you don't see your country listed, you can go to suicide.org and find um, a number that you can call and speak to somebody who can help you. So here's my closing advice and a lovely little photo of me. <laughs> um, take care of yourself. I think that's really hard, especially for the end of sisters who are mothers to remember to stop and take some time for you. Um, you really need to rest when you need to rest. And I know we don't always get the time to rest when we need to. Um, or really try to take care of yourself with diet, um, exercise when you're physically capable of it. Um, and like I say, next, um, rest when you can because sometimes you just got to recharge your batteries and, um, you know, you're not going to be the best you if you're feeling really run back on. Eat well. Your diet is really important, but you also have to remember to treat yourself. You know, treat yourself to a massage, treat yourself to a recent talk, um, but also watch what you eat. <laughs> Find a good support network. Again, I can't stress this enough how important it is to have the support network of your friends and family and the other sisters and reaching out when you really need some help. When you're feeling really depressed and you're feeling down, 
if you're feeling like you can't um, get through the day, call up a friend and ask them to go get your groceries or to run your errands for you and, you know, just really, you know, do what you can to reach out to your number. Remember how strong you are even when you're in pain. Um, and most importantly, laughter is the best medicine. I find so when my pain is bad, I just, I really need to laugh and um, try to not be so serious about my illness. So that's a lovely little picture I took when I was at FedEx <laughs> one day and I decided to put a temporarily out of service sign right in front of my pelvis. <laughs> so I hope you guys all enjoyed that. Um, I'm going to end the presentation now. And if anybody has any questions, feel free to click on the bottom where it says Q&A, and I'm happy to answer your questions to the best of my abilities. Okay, so if anyone has a question, go ahead and type it in now, and um, Jill will take as many questions as we can in the next about 15 minutes. Sure. Okay. And uh, while we're waiting for some questions to come in, I just want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. Um, I know it's not easy when you're exhausted at the end of the day, um, and thanks for listening to me. And if you have any other questions that we don't get to tonight, please feel free to email me at endowarriors at gmail.com, and um, I'm happy to speak with everyone. So can you see the comment that we just received? Yes. Um, so thank you all for the information and for your time. Oh, thank you for listening. Um, it's really nice that you have to say that. <laughs> I think it's so sweet. Um, and thank you, everyone, for coming to listen to me tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, you can also follow us on Facebook.com slash support. Um, and we also have a private group that's for education and support, which is um, Facebook.com slash group slash warriors. Okay. Does anybody have any last minute questions? Jill? Jill, would you mind giving up that link one more time for the endopedia? That looks like a really great link. For which one, Eric? Um, I have written down the endopedia. I think it was endopedia.com, but I'm not sure. I think it's just these slides. Yeah, it's um, info. Not info. Okay. Yeah. Here I can go back to um to that slide for you. Um, I think that was where did I put Dr. Redwine's website? Ah, right here. Yes, Dr. Redwine's website. Hey, Kat. Good to see you here. Um, she said to say thank you so much for the presentation. It's so much great information. I love how you openly discuss everything. That's me. <laughs> I'm very open about everything. Um, and that's kind of why I tell women that they can feel free to privately message me. I'm happy to talk with you about any subject, um, whether it be pelvic pain, sexual pain, bowel stuff. Like, you know, I'm an open book. I have no shame anymore. You know, I'm kind of over it. <laughs> Um, you know, I, the endo what crew here, the, sorry, the endo what film crew was here yesterday to film me for their follow-up documentary. Um, and I had to put some medication on, like, my hip butt area, and I was like, oh, excuse me, I have to take my butt out. And I'm like, wait a minute, you guys have, like, pretty much seen me half naked because they came to one of my pelvic floor physical therapy um, sessions to film. And so I was like, oh, wait a minute, I should have no shame in front of you. So I'm reminding you guys, you know, Please feel free to talk to me about any topic. There's no topic too taboo. Um, as I said, you know, I talked very openly about my vagina earlier because you kind of have to. You kind of have to get over the stigma um, of the disease and about our private parts and about menstruation and sexuality. Um, if you don't, then no one's going to learn anything. So um, please feel free to contact me if, if you're too shy to um, discuss your question here openly. 
I totally understand that, and it's perfectly fine. You can contact me over email or over Facebook. I'm happy to talk to everybody. Jill, can you give out the information on your organization one more time? We had a, a question about. Um, sure. Sure. So um, our website, if you want to go to our website and learn a little more about Endo Warriors, is um, endowarriorssupport.com, and warriors is plural, endowarriorssupport.com. Um, and for those who live in the areas where we have meetings, um, like New York City, um, you can click on um, meetings and events, um, and we have things on our calendar. We will actually be having a meeting in Manhattan this Sunday. Um, and next month, we're having a puppy party with a shelter um, on October 14th. If you want to visit us on Facebook for our public Facebook page where we do um, education, we do links about endometriosis and its related um, conditions, um, and we do links about chronic pain and things like that, and awareness projects, um, our Facebook page is facebook.com. Um, slash and the warriors support. And then we also have a private group, so um, especially for patients who don't want things um, about endometriosis showing up in their new feed, um, who or who might want to ask questions to a group of endo sisters um, or start a discussion topic regarding endometriosis. That's um, facebook.com slash groups slash and the warriors. Um, so Kat is asking how um, you can access the presentation in the future. Um, it's going to be recorded. So I believe Erin said it's going to be on the website. Is that correct, Erin? Yes. We can post the link up on our website. And um, if anyone would like to receive um, a link via email, I'll be happy to email that out to you. I have everyone's email who participated this evening. So um, I can do that as well. And we can, I can send a link to you as well, Jill, and if you want to go on your Facebook page. Yeah. Um, I'll post that on Endor's Facebook page, and I'll also, also post it on uh, my personal Facebook page. Great. Yes. So Kat would also like the email. <laughs> Thanks, Kat. I'm glad you liked it. Thank you, Kat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and our, I'm sorry, I didn't even say our um, website address. It is rm, as in mouse, c as in cat, charity.org. So that's rmccharity.org. And um, I'm just going through back some of the, back through some of the slides in case anybody wanted some more resources. Um, Andrew Cook's book, Andrew Cook's books, <laughs> sorry, I'm a little tongue-tied tonight. Um, both of his books, Stop Endometriosis and Pelvic Pain and the Endopatient Survival Guide are both must-read books for women with endo. Um, Dr. Braverman's website is preventingmiscarriage.com. Infertility website is resolve.org. And don't forget about Casey Berna, who is willing to speak to um, anyone here tonight one-to-one. Um, -one. She will, um, you know, counsel you with any infertility struggles and point you in the right direction if you're struggling with infertility um, or miscarriage. Um, also, the IC network, ic-network.com, is really great for anybody struggling with um, IC issues. Amy Stein's book, Heal Pelvic Pain, is another great one for um, pelvic floor physical therapy. Sorry, I see a chat coming through, but there we go. Jody, thank, thank you that it was wonderful to hear me speak um, and that she would also like the email link. Um, we'll make sure to send that over to you. Um, Alexandra Milfa was the website for um, mindfulness meditation, and she also does counseling. Um, and AONMotherNature.com was for um, CBD oil. Um, but now ask if we have any support groups and sessions on the West Coast. Um, so, yeah, there's Riverside Medical Clinic that does um, this group as well. Um, we're currently in the process of trying to get some groups started in Portland and hopefully Los Angeles. Um, we're working really hard to get some new groups started. Um, Casey Byrne is actually going to work with us um, this year um, at making more endometriosis um, endoware satellite groups. So if anyone is interested, yes, Kat, we totally need one in Texas. I hope you'll do that for us soon. 
if you would like to apply to run an Endo Warriors group in New York City, um, go to our website, endowarriorsupport.com, and click on Apply to be a satellite head so we have your information. Um, and we'll have someone get back to you once we set up um, our, our new criteria um, for support group heads. Um, we're going to be hopefully opening in more cities um, around the country and hopefully around the world really soon. Um, I also just wanted to go through all the links and resources for anyone who wants them immediately. Um, Healing Painful Sex by Jeff Cody and Nancy Fish. Um, and if you're looking for toys that might be appropriate for a woman with endometriosis, um, Toys in Babeland, um, Pleasure Chest, and 2 com were all some of my favorite for I've found um, toys that were really helpful. I also wanted to mention somebody asked me earlier about TENS units, which I find um, to be really great tools that sometimes can be a little intense. Um, and if you're kind of looking for that kind of pain relief, that TENS units are too intense for you, you can actually even use a vibrator on your belly because the vibrations can also distract your brain from pain. And I actually do that only where sometimes I'll put one on um, my right ovary to give me a little bit of pain relief. Um, we were in Vegas, lovely. I would love to come out to Vegas sometimes, but I'm not able to travel right now. <laughs> um, so hopefully, Vanessa, when you go to visit your family in San Diego, you can attend some of the meetings um, that are in, um, in Riverside. Great. Awesome. Well, do you guys have any more questions? Um, Go ahead and we're going to start wrapping this up. So if you have any last minute questions, uh, go ahead and type those in now. Um, but in the meantime, Jill, I'd like to thank you so much for taking time out of your, your night to uh, speak to our group, and we really appreciate it. Um, and thank you all again for participating um, in tonight's webinar event. I think we've got one. Oh, okay, Gladys, yes, I will add you to our email. Um, I'll be sure to do that. Uh, and thank you so much for coming tonight. It was it was really wonderful to talk to you guys about what I've learned so far. Yes, you have some amazing information, and I feel like we've learned so much. So I can't wait to get this link up and uh, send it out to everybody. It's just really, really wonderful. So um, thank you again, Jill. Thank you, everybody, for participating. Um, so that's the end of our our first webinar, we did it. Um, <laughs> so one last thing before we finish up, we will be hosting another webinar, part of our um, series of webinars. Um, and we will have, actually, I'm so glad you talked about Dr. Quick, because we actually have him speaking next month. I know, we're so excited. So that will be Tuesday, October 25th at 7 p.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time. So for those of you who are on the East Coast or are international, um, please make sure you, uh, you know, set your calendars accordingly. Um, so, any of you who don't know about Dr. Sex, he's a world-renowned endometriosis specialist, and as Jill said, he's the author of Top Endometriosis and Pelvic Pain. He's also the co-author of the Endopatient Survival Guide. So, he'll be here to answer your questions, and um, if you'd like to sign up for that meeting, please email me, just as you did for this webinar. Um, that email is Aaron at rmccharity.org and you can kind of see it there. I, I put my email down there at the bottom of the, um, the uh, page right there. Um, and thank you all. Thank you, Joe. Have a wonderful evening. Thanks, guys. Have a good night. Mm -hmm. <laughs>